Well, good morning. Uh, it's, it's a real honor to be here, um, not only at um, UCSD and in the inaugural and the first annual lecture on US-Mexico relationships. I want to thank uh, both Peter and Rafael for their kind invitation. And I should say, it's great to be in San Diego, not to visit prototypes, but to be here at UCSD. And, uh, and that's, that's the purpose of my visit here. I'll, uh, I'm, I'm going to spend some time with you here at the university, then I'll be with uh, San Diego's mayor. Um, tomorrow I'm, um, I'm going to be at Sandag, and then we're going to visit one of the main projects that will bring us together, which is the new Opai uh, project uh, as a port of entry. It's not a wall, it's actually a throughway, a better throughway. Uh, it's going to be jointly planned to have one of the uh, state of the art crossing for people and things uh, both ways. So uh, that's what we're doing, that's what we believe in. and. Um, it's a real, it, it's a real um, uh, honor to be here. I should say this is not my first time at UCSD. Um, I was here roughly perhaps 25 years ago. I was a student at MIT and I, had to, I, was, um, I was on a deadline um, to complete a paper. So most of my time here was stuck at the library, which is the uh, UFO shaped uh, <laughs> library. So I, that's basically my recollection. So I, I, uh, I I cherish the opportunity to be back here and, and know a little bit more about the about the university. I want to, I, I, I think that um, I want to congratulate um, UCSD and the uh, and the School uh, of Global Policy and Strategy for a fantastic hiring uh, uh, on Rafael's hiring. You've got um, we're a bit jealous as as an MI, as a as an ITAM uh, graduate uh, and part of the ITAM community. We lost an amazing. A leader and scholar on Mexico-U.S. relationships, but are, uh, but we are we're very proud that he's here, and uh, we wish you the best, Rafael, and thank you for, thank you for having me here, um, uh, to today. Let's um, let's talk a little bit about where we are, on the Mexico-U.S. relationship. It's uh, these are, this is definitely challenging times after the election of Donald Trump as U.S. president, but these are also new challenges. Um, I, one of the first things I did when I was appointed uh, January last year as foreign minister was to talk to the experts, to all the people that, that have been involved in Mexico-U.S. relationships, either as diplomats or working in other positions in government, uh, scholars, people in the, in the business community. And um, I very quickly realized that there was no playbook. This was a, there was a, a, a new challenge, a different challenge. So the recipes of the past were not going to work. One of, the, one of the key insights that I got, I got it from Rafael. And I think Rafael uh, has made a point uh, very clearly that the strategy that worked over the past maybe 20, 25 years, which um, is not going to be, is, is not uh, feasible anymore. And let me say what that strategy was. After NAFTA was enacted, Mexico retreated from, from a very uh, uh, cross-sectional effort in which Mexico displayed lobbying and talking um, to people in Congress uh, at the local level, the business community, uh, cross country. And we centered, as a country, we centered the relationship on the White House. And particularly, we anchored the relationship on having a good personal relationship and a meeting of the minds of the President of Mexico and the President of the US. And that actually kind of worked. It worked well. And we can remember President Ernesto Cedillo and President Bill Clinton having a great relationship and doing things together. And of course, uh, President uh, Fox and, and President uh, Bush, and then President Bush and President Calderon and President Obama and President Calderon and President Obama and President Peña Nieto. Well, that is not gonna work anymore. That we learned very quickly uh, during the campaign and in the election of Donald Trump. So that's the first thing that we uh, needed to change. So what we've been doing over the past 14 months is to reestablish relationships. And as Rafael was very rightly so saying, not centering, not anchoring the diplomatic efforts only in Washington. And certainly not only in the White House. This does not mean that we do not need to have a very good relationship, a working relationship uh, with the White House and the Trump administration. So that's been, a, that's been a second part of the effort. We need to go look through, look beyond our very public uh, differences with the Trump administration 
and be able to work, to get uh, to do work together, because there are many things that depend on that relationship following. And obviously, there's a, there's a renegotiation of our trade agreement, and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, it, it goes well beyond NAFTA. There are many, many things uh, on daily life in the Mexican economy, in Mexican society, that depend on how we deal with uh, the US government. So we got to engage uh, with, with the White House and being able to have a working relationship that goes beyond our differences. And we have been able to do so. I, I, I would even say that, uh, according to the number of meetings and phone calls and, and, uh, and the closeness of their, this is a relationship that is probably closer um, out of need with this administration than with the previous administrations. And um, it's, it's not, not necessarily because we agree on everything, certainly not, but because we need to work um, together. We also did some, some changes on the Mexican side. Um, over the years, on the Mexican side, the relationship was fragmented across Mexican agencies. It's very natural. If you, I was, I was, um, I was Minister of Finance or Secretary of the Treasury for Mexico for um, almost four years, and I had a very natural working relationship with my counterpart, then Jack Lou, the Secretary of, um, of the Treasury here. Uh, in the US, and quite frankly, with very little intervention from the foreign ministry or the Mexican embassy in Washington. And if you ask every agency in the Mexican government, it just happened the same. It was very natural, and, uh, and, and that's the way it was. But now, given the changes in Washington and the challenge that we have, we have in front of us, that had to be rearranged. So President Peña Nieto, at the beginning of the last year, decided to have a much more centralized, much more coordinated approach to the relationship, which we, where we can have a comprehensive approach and a strategy, a coordinator under the Ministry of Foreign Relations. And that has been pretty much my job for the last uh, 14 months. And uh, this, what this allows us is to have a more integral, comprehensive uh, conversation um, with with our US counterparts. It does not mean that we are um, exchanging a trade deal for cooperation in other areas, but it does mean that we are having a conversation that is about everything and not just fractions or separate lanes. And uh, that, that has proven to be uh, quite, uh, quite effective. How do we deal? So, so once we, we decided that this is new, that we've got to We've got to engage not only with the Trump administration, but with everybody in the US, and that we get to do it in a very coordinated way from our side. Um, what, what's, what's the strategy? Well, the strategy, first of all, is based on principles and, and keeping in mind some very important things about Mexico. First of all, we need to remind ourselves that Mexico is a big, important country to the US, and it's a sovereign country. So the first thing that we need to, we, we need to think about, uh, how we deal with uh, uh, the, the new administration in the US, is that we deal with it as a sovereign country. And it's Mexico that's going to make its own decisions at the end of the day. We might agree or not on several things with the administration, but it's up to the Mexicans to decide what we do. And we need not to forget that Mexico and the relationship with Mexico is quite important for the US on many fronts. Just think about trade. We happen to be uh, an important destination for exports. No matter what you think of NAFTA, NAFTA is crucial to keep um, jobs in the US. Uh, our, our calculation is that roughly between five and six million jobs in the US depend on NAFTA. That's certainly the case, certainly the case for um, uh, Southern California. Rafael just provided some uh, interesting figures on how important this is for Southern California. But it's also important for Texas, it's important for the farm sector, it's important for dairy in, in Wisconsin, it's important even for car making in Michigan. So the, the uh, access, access to the Mexican market is quite important to, uh, to the US economy. And of course, access to the US market is very important to the Mexican economy. So, so that's one thing that we should, we should always remember. Mexico is quite important. 
But it's not only on, on economics that is important. Um, it's also security. It's also cooperation in immigration. And there are many fronts in which the relationship is important for the US. So let's keep that, let's keep that in mind and then set here what our objectives are. Our, our objectives are, uh, um, President Peña Nieto uh, at the beginning of the year, last year, was, was quite explicit about what we want to do in the, uh, in the relationship. And he set 10 main objectives for um, our uh, conversations and negotiations with uh, the, the Trump administration. First of all, we are a country that believes in the rule of law, um, uh, both in Mexico and in the US. We don't condone or promote illegal immigration, but we do. Uh, we, we have an obligation and, uh, and a belief in human rights. And we think that the, um, any authority in the US, either federal, state, or local, should protect the rights uh, of Mexican nationals, regardless of their immigration status. And to us, that's very important. And we are in uh, and, and one of the tasks that we're doing, and certainly Marcela Celorio, our, our, our great consul here, She's uh, very much engaged in that, in protecting Mexicans, um, either, regardless of their status. This does not mean that we are fighting against the law and the and enforcement of the US law. On the contrary, we, wh what we're asking is that due process and human rights are completely guaranteed for Mexicans. Um, we want to have a coordinated uh, migration policy. It's important to understand that the uh, immigration from Mexico to the US has completely changed in the last decade. Uh, net migration, and many people don't know that, but net migration into the US has been negative. Mexican nationals are more those that leave the US than those that come here every year. And, but the phenomenon that we have that is new is that Mexico has become a throughway for people coming from uh, Central America uh, through Mexico into the US. And that presents a challenge both for Mexico and for the US. So we've got to have uh, we've got to have cooperation uh, on immigration policy. And one thing is that, um, uh, that uh, and, and, the, and the third objective is very much linked to that, which is Mexico and the US should work together on Central America. And we should work together with an, uh, a clear focus on development. Immigration enforcement is not gonna be enough. We got to, uh, we, we got to develop projects, engage with the communities uh, at the local level, and cooperate more forcefully on that. Um, going into economics, first of all, we want to ensure the free flow of remittances uh, of Mexicans into Mexico. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important flow of money, and we believe that's the right of anybody to send money to their families or relatives. Um, and uh, so that's our fourth objective, is to ensure the flow of remittances. The fifth element of our, um, of our objectives is to stop the illegal flow of guns, cash, that get into Mexico from the US. And this is important because we, when, 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 when I see all the conversation and all the rhetoric about the border and border security in the US, it's always about things that should not, things that, that, that move from, from south to north, like drugs, that should be stopped. But there, there's a missing element in the conversation, which is the things that go south. And the, if, if you think that, according to um, several studies, over 90% of the guns that uh, crime organizations in Mexico uh, use come from the US and cross the border illegally, uh, then we have a problem. And the, it should be the best interest of the US to stop that, and also cash. Uh, most of the cash that goes into Mexico crosses, crosses the border and I mean, I, I mean bulk cash. This is, this is uh, paper money that crosses into Mexico somehow. So, so we need to, when we, uh, when we talk about border security, it, it's got to go both ways. And we, we got to uh, ensure that uh, there's, when we, as we fight um, the drug trade, um, it's, a, it's done under a principle of shared responsibility. Let me just stop here for a moment because over many years, and unfortunately we keep hearing that on both sides, the, the, uh, the debate on, on drugs has been pretty much a blame game. In Mexico, we constantly blame the US 
for the high demand of drugs. And rightly so. And we say, okay, um, a lot of Mexican, particularly young Mexicans, are being killed, violence created by the drug trade. And that's because there's, there's such a high demand for illegal drugs in the US. So we say the problem is demand. You come here, and uh, the debate is exactly the opposite. People will say, well, the problem is supply, because Mexico is providing drugs uh, to the US. Uh, to, to the U.S., so the problem is you are you are the problem. The problem is supply. I'm an economist. I think of this as a market, and the market is supply and demand. And if we continue to play the blame game, we are only surrendering a strategic advantage to the transnational crime organizations. We got to do better. We got to work under a framework of shared responsibility and address the problem comprehensively. And think of this as a business model, a deeply criminal business model that's got to be disrupted uh, from sourcing to financing, to distribution, to retail, everything. We got to do a better job, and we can only do it together. If we continue playing the blame game, we're not going to get very far on this fight. It's a crucial fight, and a lot of lives, both sides of the border, depend on it. Um, on trade, it's very simple. We want to keep trade, free trade, continue to be actually free. Uh, we believe in free trade. We believe in rules-based trade. And we want that to we want that to continue. We don't oppose the renegotiation of NAFTA. We understand that NAFTA is a relatively old agreement. It was crafted um, 25 years ago or so. The world has changed. There was no internet. Uh, the energy sector in Mexico was completely closed. So uh, for sure, we can do better. We can have a better NAFTA. But that does not. But we certainly want to keep. We want to. We're going to keep trade uh, under a rules uh, that apply to everybody. And B, these are that that promote integration. We strongly believe that North America is, is, a, is a region of potential. North America, if you think about it, a region comprised by Mexico, the US, and Canada, should be the most competitive region in the world. We have everything. We've got human resources, we've got natural resources, we are very competitive in many industries. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be, as a region, the most competitive for the next few decades. Uh, but for that, we need to work together, and the, and the best way to do it is through free trade. Um, we think that some sec new sectors got to be included in trade. As I said, energy was not part of it. Um, E-commerce didn't exist. So there were no rules. There are no rules under NAFTA for, the, for, for, for that. Um, so, so we want to include those, those sectors. Then let me talk about wages and labor conditions in Mexico. We want whatever we do in NAFTA to be good for the Mexican workers. Uh, it, it's a completely wrong development model to, uh, to bet on attracting investment into Mexico by paying uh, low wages uh, to Mexicans. And that is probably one of the reasons why NAFTA has not lived to expectations, is that the convergence in wages has not happened. That probably has to do more with other reasons, like the entry of China into WTO and technology changes and things like that, automation. But um, whatever we do has got to be good for the Mexican worker. And we want the Mexican work worker to earn more uh, and we want um, the country to compete to attract capital, not by paying badly to by paying low wages, but by being more productive and, and being more competitive through through uh, productivity. Well, we we got to do a, a we got to make sure that uh, investments continue to be protected. This is, by the way, a very important debate right now. Uh, a couple of days ago, 99 senators, and for those of you who know the, the numbers, 99 is just shy of one to, 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 to the total number of senators in the U.S., sent a letter to Ambassador Robert Lighthizer, uh, the U.S. trade representative, um, asking him not to end Chapter 11 of NAFTA. For those of you that are not trade experts, and I presume that uh, mo mo most of us here are not trade experts, that's the chapter that protects investments. So if a U.S. company Think a company like Walmart, AT&T, Exxon, Citigroup goes to Mexico, uh, and if they are mistreated by the Mexican government or a state government or a, a town, they can go to the NAFTA mechanisms and protect themselves against arbitrary decisions. That's a mechanism called investor state dispute settlement. Uh, that's the ISDS, that's chapter 11 of NAFTA. Well, President Trump wants to eliminate that. And that um, we think that's a bad idea. We still don't have a very clear understanding why is that, uh, but we think it's a bad idea for U.S. companies uh, and for uh, the region 
to weaken investment protection mechanisms. So we want to continue to have robust, robust uh, mechanisms. And by the way, this, what I'm saying here is what President Peña Nieto said back in January last year, and the letter happened yesterday or two days ago. So this is something that we were clearly promoting from the, from the beginning. And then, let me, the, the, uh, our, last, our last priority that was mentioned last year uh, by the president is on the border. We want a border that unites us, not a border, border that divides us. And uh, we believe in the concept of thinning the border, making it thinner, so the border is secure, but at the same time it allows the free flow of people and goods. That should happen um, in neighbor nations that work together well. Of course, alongside with, the, uh, with our objectives, we were very explicit in uh, highlighting, what, highlighting what our limitations are. What are the things that we will never do? And uh, first of all, we will never accept the violation of human rights uh, for Mexican nationals um, in the U.S. And we will continue to, we'll continue to, to uh, deploy all our resources uh, on that front. I, I should say that we have extraordinary collaboration with many uh, organizations here in the U.S. Uh, and we work together and we've learned a lot about the U.S. legal system over the past, over the past few months and uh, we will continue to do that uh, in order to provide guidance and even legal representation. We are providing legal representation to thousands of Mexican nationals here in the, in the U.S. We are not social activists. We do not promote or condone legality, but we, and we work through the courts and we work through the laws of the, of the land. Um, I'll give you another example of things that we never do. We never accept extraterritorial application of internal uh, immigration policies. Uh, at some point, uh, the Trump administration said that they would, be, they would be sending into Mexico people from other nationalities that they do not uh, want in this country. We have no obligation and we will not take them. Why? We are Mexico, only, only Mexico can define its own immigration policies. So we, are, we will completely oppose any, any policies, any immigration policies that um, uh, imply any attempt of extraterritoriality. And of course, and I said this probably uh, uh, over a thousand times publicly and over a million times privately, we will not pay for any war. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, how, how are we how are we um, uh, doing on, on NAFTA? Where is that process going? First, first of all, I, I, should, I should tell you, it took a while for us to learn what, are the, what were the actual changes that the Trump administration wanted on NAFTA. We've heard enough from the campaign and from the beginning of the government that NAFTA um, is not an agreement that President Trump is particularly fond of. And uh, we've heard things like, is the worst deal ever? Is the... Uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a tragedy, things like that. But when we asked, well, what is exactly that you want to change in the agreement, we got very little, uh, very, very little specifics until the month of October. The formal negotiations started in, in, in August, but it was only until October that, that the, the negotiations um, uh, got going and we, we got uh, in black and white what the proposals are. Some of those proposals are quite reasonable, I should say. Others are unconventional. Others go against the spirit of free trade. A lot of focus has been on the auto sector. Uh, as you know, President Trump uh, uh, is against trade deficits. And uh, the trade deficit between Mexico and the US is explained mostly by cars. If you take out the, if, if, if you remove the numbers from the auto sector from the trade balance, actually Mexico has a deficit with the US, not the other way around. So there's been a lot of work on things like rules of origin, national content rules, um, on, the, on, on cars. There's been a lot of debate on um, dispute resolution mechanisms. I already mentioned uh, uh, Chapter 11 or the ISDS. There is also discussion on Chapter 19, which is the, uh, the chapter that provides uh, remedies, trade remedies, when, when a, a country does anti-dumping or countervailing duties. Um, how do you respond to that? So that's Chapter 19. Chapter 20, which is a chapter that, that is about disputes between governments. Um, there's, the, the, there's a proposal to eliminate that chapter. Um, our, what, what we say is any trade agreement 
has got to have trade resolution, uh, trade dispute resolution mechanisms. Without a mechanism to, dis to, 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 to discuss uh, uh, disputes, the trade agreement becomes very hard to enforce and can be very ineffective. So we are open to making them more modern. We acknowledge that we have agreements with other countries. Mexico is a very, uh, very open economy. We have trade agreements with 46 countries. Most of those agreements are, were done after NAFTA and probably the provisions for dispute resolutions are better, more flexible, more efficient in the new agreements. So we are very open to changing those, but the thing that's, but we cannot, we, we cannot have an agreement that does not address those concerns. Uh, we don't like the idea of the agreement dying every five years, the so-called sunset provision. Trade agreements are also agreements to promote investment. And investment is a long-run uh, proposition. And if you uh, introduce an element of uncertainty that the rules might change every five years, that is not good for investment, that is not good for value creation, and that is not good for jobs, uh, both in America uh, and Mexico, as well as Canada. So that's, that's, another, that's another area that's been of controversy. Uh, we've, had, we've had agreements and made some substantial progress on the modernization of the, of the agreement, uh, including, a, for the first time, uh, a anti-corruption chapter that has been already finalized and I think addresses a very, very important challenge that we face in Mexico. So NAFTA, the NAFTA framework will now strengthen that uh, and, and we're, 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 enthousi uh, we're enthused about it. And then we have a set of other issues that probably are not at the core of the, of the discussion. Um, what is going to happen? Are we going to have a trade agreement or not? I should. The honest, um, the honest answer is, I don't know. But we're very, trying very hard. And I can tell you, it's not only Mexico trying, it's also Canada. And yes, the US is also trying very hard. We have different points of view, but we are trying to reach common ground. And I see a sincere effort from the three sides to get, uh, to get this across the, across the line as soon as possible. Um, I, I think uh, the month of, month of April would be uh, crucial. And uh, the, the goal um, that our trade negotiators, negotiators have expressed is to have an agreement in principle uh, by the end of the month. Uh, hopefully that is possible. But, um, and uh, we want to do this as quickly as, as feasible for one reason. We want to remove uncertainty. There are many decisions, investment decisions, hiring decisions that have been delayed or postponed because of the uncertainty. So the, the earlier that we remove that element of uncertainty is going to be good uh, for, the, for the economy, for jobs, and for investment. But I should also say very clearly, we will not take a deal that is not good. So beyond doing this quickly, what is important is to have a good deal. And we think that, the best, uh, that, that this is not a zero-sum game. Trade is about creating value for both sides, in this case, the three sides. So it's got to be a win-win-win, and we strongly believe that there's, there's tremendous opportunity to have a win-win-win in this, what we call the NAFTA 2.0 or, or the new NAFTA. So we are negotiating in good faith. I should say that we have a tremendous team on the Mexican side, very experienced professionals, very serious uh, technical, uh, technical experts, and uh, I should also say we do not negotiate NAFTA or anything else through Twitter or social media. <laughs> we, we do it. We do. We are. We do it in a serious way, and we'll continue to. And we will continue to. We'll continue to do so. Another front of the relationship. I think we are. We are making uh, uh, substantial progress on advancing new ideas on how to address the transnational crime organizations, and we've had high-level meetings over the past year that we, that, that, that continue now. Uh, we're working closely on Central America, as I said. And uh, we're even, uh, we're, we're even uh, working together with the White House and other agencies on developing things like a new uh, mechanism for temporary workers uh, uh, in sectors like agriculture. So those are not, not finalized, are part, part of the conversation, but the relationship is not only NAFTA and it's not only about a wall, it's about many other things. And we are, and we don't want the differences to allow, uh, the differences to define the relationship. We'll continue to engage. We are we are we are we are not um, uh, we we are not yielding to the things that we should not yield. But we will continue to engage and try to make this as 
as strong as a relationship as, as possible. Um, I said at the beginning that one of our strategies has, has been not to center the relationship on the presidency uh, or the White House or even Washington. And I, I am very proud to say that these past 14 months have been a, a, a tremendous show of support we've, uh, in, many, in many places around the country. And we are very proud of how many voices, important voices, from the business sector, from politics, from social organizations, have come in support, not of the Mexican government, but of Mexico and Mexicans, and the Mexican community here. And uh, perhaps nowhere else around the country that is strongly felt as in California. I've visited, uh, I've, this is my first visit as foreign minister to San Diego, but I've been in Sacramento, I've been in Los Angeles, I've been in San Francisco, uh, in Bay Area. And uh, it's, 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 an, it's, it's amazing how important um, the closeness uh, of Mexico and California has become in all fronts. It's not only the economy, it's not only NAFTA, it's culture, it's society, it's science, it's education. And uh, we, are, we are very proud of that. And the, the reason for that happening is because here in California, you got probably um, a, a, one of the best group of Mexicans around the world that live here every day, that contribute to the economy, that work very hard, are creative, are smart, uh, are, are, uh, are very active, and those are the best ambassadors that we can have as a country, and we feel very proud of them, and our obligation is to continue to work with them, to support them as we can, uh, with all the our means available to us. And so, um, I landed here, I'll open to questions, and thank you again for having me. Thank you.